Nezah. On May 23rd, the Pflugerville Police Department had put out to the media that they were looking for Raul Meza in connection with the murder of 80-year-old Jesse Fraga, who had been murdered at 706 Campfire Trail. Mr. Fraga's body was discovered on May 20th when his family had called in to check welfare since they hadn't spoken with him in over a week. A belt had been found around the neck of Mr. Fraga and the Travis County Medical Examiner's Office noted that Mr. Fraga had suffered a puncture wound through his neck and severed cervical spine. During the course of the investigation, the Pflugerville Police Department uh, had found that Meza was also Mr. Fraga's roommate and Meza had become a person of interest. They also noted that Meza had, be, had been uh, convicted of homicide in 1982. On May the 24th, Raul Meza called the Austin Police Department 311 line and he was transferred to the homicide line where he spoke with Detective Patrick Reed. Meza proceeded to confess to the murder of Jesse Fraga and he also implicated himself in the murder of a female on, sever on Sarah Drive several years earlier. Austin homicide detectives and APD analyst Mazak uh, located only one case that met the parameters that had been set out by Meza, and that was found to be the death of Gloria Lofton in 2019. Austin police officers had responded to 4805 Sarah Drive on May the 9th, 2018 to locate the victim, Gloria Lofton, who was deceased. DNA was recovered from that scene, which was sent off to be checked through CODIS, the combined DNA uh, system. There was a hidden CODIS which linked Raul Meza to the DNA taken from the scene. Although it was not until the phone call from Raul Meza to Patrick Reed on May the 24th that investigators were able to charge Meza with Lofton's murder. For more on that phone call, here is Homicide Detective Patrick Reed. Good afternoon. My name is Detective Patrick Reed. It's P-A-T-R-I-C-K-R-E-E-D. So on May 24th, uh, I answered the homicide mainline and the caller stated, my name is Raul Meza and you're looking for me. Meza then went on to detail his relationship with Jesse Fraga and detailed the manner in which he murdered Mr. Fraga, including details that had not yet been released to the public. Meza described his life in and out of prison and said, I quote, I got out in 2016. I end up murdering a lady soon afterwards it was on Sarah Drive. Meza told me case-specific facts, which allowed me and my partner, Detective Katie Connor, to reopen the case. And I was able to confer with the Travis County Medical Examiner's Office and doctors reviewing the case. And with the additional case facts, the death of Gloria Lofton was ruled a homicide and uh, the manner was strangulation. The phone call provided me enough probable cause to file a capital murder arrest warrant for the murder of Gloria Lofton uh, against Mr. Meza. We then coordinated with the Pflugerville Police Department and verified the information provided by Mr. Meza matched the case facts of their investigation. Pflugerville PD was provided with a copy of the recorded phone call to assist with their development of probable cause and Pflugerville PD issued a warrant for first degree murder for Mr. Meza. Uh, we then learned that Roa Meza had been arrested and convicted of aggravated robbery in 1975. And in 1982, Meza was charged with the murder of an eight-year-old girl. Um, Detective Connor has identified multiple cold cases that have a similar <coughs> MO, and we're looking into those for future leads. In reference to the 1982 case, we learned the primary investigator of that homicide was Homicide Sergeant Investigator Bruce Mills. Mr. Mills is now serving as the interim city manager for the city of Austin, and I'll turn it over to him to discuss the, discuss the details of that 1982 case. Sir. Good afternoon. I'm Bruce Mills, and as I said, I'm assistant city manager, interim assistant city manager in Austin. Kind of hard to believe, and I get a call on Friday about a case that was, what, 40 years in, in the, uh, since I've even ever saw the case, ever saw the details, and I remember it like it was yesterday. The um, eight-year-old Kendra Page uh, found, what was it, January 3rd, right after the Christmas holidays, found deceased uh, behind a Langford Elementary School um, and had been uh, assaulted and murdered. Um, we worked the case, my partners, uh, Ed Viegas and Gary Fleming, it was years ago in homicide, and we were able to uh, 
to tie the case to Roe Mesa. Um, normally a case like that would take, you know, weeks if not months to, uh, to assemble the facts and the data and put it together. And in this particular case, we were, we'd gone to the grand jury a few times and presented evidence and talked to the DA, talked to the grand jurors, talked to many, to many witnesses. Um, and then suddenly, about the fifth or sixth week after this case occurred, murder occurred, uh, we get a call that Roe Mesa had pled to, uh, pled guilty to a murder charge, and it pled to and agreed to a 30-year term, prison term. Uh, we were uh, shocked, um, disappointed, uh, with no really explanation as to, to why this case didn't go to trial. The, uh, we never really got solid answers on that. Um, some, uh, I think it was 11 years later, uh, this guy was released, and, uh, and I was assistant chief at the time, police department. Um, he was released and was back, was gonna be some, at some point back in Travis County. Uh, talked to the media at the time about the, the travesty of justice even then, uh, when he had only done 11 years from a 30 year uh, sentence. And then here we are 20 years after that, 30 years after that, 93 to now. Uh, and as we just said, suspect in, in other cases, cold cases. Um, so, you know, here's a guy that should have spent the rest of his life, probably from the time he nearly killed a gentleman in, when he was 15 years old, certified as an adult, later commits capital murder, pleads to murder, is released 11 years later, and has killed how many people we don't know. So here's a serial killer that, that uh, justice was not served. So it was a travesty of justice uh, totally in this case. And now, U.S. Marshal. Thank you, Manager. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brandon Fila. Last name is spelled F as in Frank, I-L-L-A. I'm a Deputy U.S. Marshal assigned to the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force. I'm also the public uh, resource officer here for the Western District of Texas with the U.S. Marshal Service. Uh, kind of our role with this, with the, with the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force, is the Pflugerville Police Department contacted us on May 24th, which was a Wednesday, and requested assistance from this task force to locate and apprehend Raul Meza, who was 62 years of age. At that time, Raul Meza was listed, uh, he currently was listed as a person of interest for the homicide that took place uh, in Pflugerville um, and um, also had a warrant for unauthorized use of a, of a motor vehicle. Uh, so that is really the warrant that we went on. That was a felony warrant that gave us the uh, permission to really go on and, and look for Raul Meza because uh, at that point he was only a person of interest on this homicide. Quickly, as we developed information with the task force on Wednesday, by that afternoon, we had uh, obtained information from the Austin Police Department Homicide Division that they had a phone call come in from an individual that stated he was Raul Meza, uh, and he admitted uh, to the killing of these victims. Um, so with that uh, partnership there with the Austin Police Department, the Fluterville Police Department, uh, they were able to obtain additional warrants for homicide uh, on Friday, May 26. So now the task force is now tasked with locating Meza, who has two outstanding warrants for a homicide, as well as that uh, unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. Um, looking into Meza, we, you know, uh, used many techniques in this. Uh, many of those techniques led us information that uh, Meza was known to travel the I-35 corridor uh, to frequent host hotels, uh, as far as even a hotel at uh, 45 and 183 there on the Austin Cedar Park uh, city limits. And from there, we were able to establish more in intelligence that we knew at this time that Raul Meza was considered armed and dangerous, he was su suicidal, and had violent tendencies. Uh, and that's exactly what this task force um, is here to do with the, par the strong partnerships that we have with cities uh, such as the Austin Police Department. Um, so we, we go into the cities uh, here in Austin, for, for, for example, and we go after the worst of the worst. Uh, and we list Raul Meza as one of those individuals. We knew from an officer's standpoint that this individual was probably likely armed. Um, and our first concern here uh, was to protect uh, our community. And to speak about that it is important to note that this past weekend, Memorial Day weekend, we had numerous officers with the Lone Star Fugitive Task Force, numerous men and women 
uh, that forfeited their leave. They forfeited their holidays, uh, which, you know, some people had vacation planned, uh, or barbecues and outings, and those individuals stood ready all weekend and worked uh, expeditedly. Like I said, this was old-fashioned law, old law enforcement work, going door to door, going hotel to hotel, uh, receiving intelligence by tips that are coming in to be able to sit at an establishment of some type of business, go through video footage where we were able to finally get on the trail of, of, uh, of Mesa. Uh, we were able, the task force was able to apprehend Mesa uh, yesterday evening. Uh, I guess it was about uh, the 8, 8.30 at night. Uh, they're at the corner of Parmer and Lamar. And let me give you that exact address. Uh, that exact address is at the 12400 block of North Lamar Boulevard. Uh, he was arrested without incident. Um, like I said, this was an investigative techniques that led us to this area. Uh, we conducted surveillance. We observed Mesa there in the area. Uh, he was there uh, talking with a crowd of transients at a bus, at a bus stop, uh, and he was on a bicycle, uh, and that is the intel that we believed he was going to be uh, traveling with anyway. It was a, some type of bike uh, or ride share program. Uh, but I think it's important to note that this task force strives and dedicates their time uh, as well to when we go after the worst of the worst because this individual here on his search incident to arrest he had a bag with him and in, in that bag uh, contained zip ties, duct tape, flashlight and a uh, 22 caliber pistol with additional rounds in that bag. Uh, but I think the men and women of this task force uh, really did things. They slowed it down. Uh, they did as safe as possible to where we could bring him before justice. And with that being said, when we bring before justice, we also uh, want to keep the victims and the victims' families uh, in our hearts on this specific case as well. Thank you. Um, I'm Detective Katie Connor, and I'm currently looking into all the cold cases that could potentially be involved with this. Um, so we are backtracking it to 1996 and even earlier. Um, so there is a good possibility that we will find additional cases as well. Do you have just a rough number of how many you know, you're looking into potentially? Right now we have between 8 and 10 cases that kind of fit the similar circumstances that we're looking at, but that could obviously grow. But there's only one he's been arrested for? Uh, he was arrested for two murder warrants, the 2019 and the 2023 case. Can anybody spell the victim's name in 2019? In 2019, the victim, it's Gloria Lofton. It's L-O-F-T-O-N. And Gloria is G-L-O-R-I-A. She was roughly 66 years old. Were there any connections you all found with the victims? Um, at this time, no. And for clarification, you said that Mr. Mesa called in to the task force and admitted to the crime? He called the homicide unit. Mm -hmm. And from there, he just y'all just kind of started chasing uh, for him or looking for him? How, was, how did that happen after that phone call? Do you want to yeah, so to, to answer your, your question, uh, we were already looking for Mesa. Um, we started that morning, uh, and then the Austin Police Department Homicide Division received that 311 uh, phone call that was forwarded to them, where Meza provided more uh, detailed information on a telephone as to that he was the individual that killed these two victims, uh, where he became also uh, what we, you know, listened to as uh, suicidal, um, and then ended that conversation uh, with those homicide detectives. <laughs> Yeah, that's not very common at all. That's one of the only times I can think of that happening in the past five, ten years. So it's pretty unique. And what day did you make that phone call? May of the 24th. May 24th? Correct. Gloria Lofton's family, uh, have you guys been able to speak with her? Because I'm sure they can let you know yes. what happened. Yes, she has been notified. And then how they feel about um, I won't put words in her mouth. I'm not sure exactly what, what the sentiment is. I just know she's been notified. Was Juan Mesa holding a job? No, on the uh, databases that we use when we look after these fugitives, like I said, that are the worst of the worst, uh, there was no indication that he had any type of stable employment here in the Austin area. Uh, but I will say, with, I think one of the key 
parts of this investigation was this individual was on uh, on parole at one point, which had already expired. Uh, but with that, uh, you know, we have the Texas Department of Criminal Justice um, Office of Inspector General on our task force. Uh, they were able to give us an insight, uh, information from the past as to family relatives, uh, previous known addresses. Uh, so that's really why we concentrated here in the Austin area from Austin to Round Rock uh, based upon that information. What state was he in when, I, I know he, there was no, I guess, issue when he was, he was arrested, but what kind of state, I mean, could you just kind of describe, you know, his mannerisms? Yeah, the mannerisms, um, the, I think the best way to describe is I think he was surprised. I think he was surprised uh, when this team um, in unmarked vehicles uh, with uh, ballistic vests that displayed, you know, police officers, task force officers, uh, U.S. Marshals, uh, they quickly uh, expedited that process. They, they uh, approached, surrounded him, and then took him into custody uh, within a blink of an eye. And I think that was a key advantage based upon what was in that, in that bag that he had. Uh, when I you know, talk about you know, the duct tape, the zip ties, uh, and the firearm with additional rounds of ammunition. So, did he state any plans for, for those? I mean, had, had any on so we won't release anything from that point, from the transportation, uh, from the scene there on Lamar here to the Austin Police Department. It's still an ongoing investigation. And I think it's important uh, to keep that uh, kind of discreet because we want to be able to uh, have justice work its system uh, to give some closure for these victims' families. And about how many days did it take for you all to uh, From the day we got it, it'd be five days. It was a five-day manhunt where I said uh, we extended, you know, to all of our resources to include the Austin Police Department, who is a uh, major provider on this task force where, uh, you know, they provide us with additional bodies or their whole uh, tactical intelligence team. Uh, so that comprised of about um, 10 officers, two sergeants. Uh, they're able to work hand in hand with these homicide detectives. Homicide detectives focus on their probable cause and uh, their investigation while we strictly uh, focus on the whereabouts uh, of Raul Mason. Mr. Peter, you said your main concern here was to protect the community. If you could just, you know, drive that home, uh, is this a fire relief for you all? Um, how does it feel to have this? Yeah, I think it's a sign of relief for not just the task force, but for everyone here that's that's back behind me. Uh, because if it wasn't for them, they wouldn't have been able to obtain a warrant. Because from that point, once we have the warrant, then the marshal service can do with what we need to do in locating this individual. Uh, but when we talk about, you know, what was our state of mind at the time, I would say there was a lot of anxiety in the room. There's a lot of anxiety when you have an individual that has lost their lives uh, to an individual that's still on the run. And we knew what he was prob you know, capable of. This is an individual that called into these detectives uh, and provided some type of uh, statement uh, that he had done what he had done. And uh, so that, that was some type of concern. And like I say, uh, the men and women of this task force, as well as these, in these uh, individuals behind me, uh, forfeited their weekends uh, to bring this case to closure within five days. As you can see, it's a, it's a big, uh, big investigation. It's still ongoing. Um, so I think hopefully that answers your question. Do you question about Mr. Mills, specifically about the 82 case. Sure. Uh, when you're talking about the whole idea that this is something when you were in ATD and now you're in the city, uh, how come this happened in the first place? I know you said the parole had expired, so once that happens, then the person is back to their normal life. But like you mentioned, this is someone that should have been behind bars. Clearly. Yeah, should have never. Should go back to the, there was the 20, this year he was 15, this guy shot. A gentleman working at a, at a, at a convenience store uh, with, the, with, with, the, with a high-powered rifle uh, and paralyzed this gentleman for the rest of his life, uh, was certified as an adult, did a few years as a, as a juvenile, uh, and then uh, committed this horrific crime of, of capital murder with an eight-year-old child. Uh, and then uh, t the fact that, that, that a, a district attorney at the time took a plea of 30 years was completely unprecedented. And then to serve 11 of that for good behavior was was even uh, even more unprecedented. Uh, and then again, the travesty of justice, where uh, as we just talked about, we don't know how many more people uh, he killed or would have killed. Uh, and so when you 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 think of those victims and their families, because somebody made a bad decision uh, 40 41 years ago uh, and let this guy for whatever reason uh, manipulate the system. And, and injustice was not served. Who do the police is out here at the moment, but I'm assuming they were working with you guys. Um, 
I'm wondering why it took them five days to let everybody know exactly how dangerous this man was. Because in the original press release, it was just very basic. But then five days later, they let us know this man is part of the murder. He's actually the house. So, and, and I don't... I don't want to put exact words in their mouth because they aren't here, but I know, like, obviously when they had their initial information, they didn't, we had, we didn't, the, it was, it happened quickly and rapidly um, when we gathered additional information and we start backtracking. Um, on top of that, I do, I know we put out, um, we put out some additional press releases, they put out some additional press releases trying to, um, um, I think we, we were all worked hand in hand with all three agencies to try and to push out more press releases, not only to inform the community, but also to uh, try to generate some tips to help uh, the task force try to locate um, Mr. Meza. So I think there were three separate press releases done last week. And then, of course, um, just over the weekend, it was just boots on the ground. Um, I did want uh, to add, um, we did talk to Royal Meza last night. We won't go into the details of that conversation because um, it's part of the investigation. But I will let you know that Mr. Meza said he was ready and prepared to kill again, and he was looking forward to it. So, so it's safe to call him a serial killer? Yes. At this point, is he detained in Travis County Jail, or where exactly? He's in Travis County Jail. Thank you, guys, for coming up. For our Spanish TV stations, we're going to do uh, Sergeant Fessel will make remarks for Spanish TV. Thank you. Sorry, one last one. Last Yeah, um, and you guys help me out here if, if I'm wrong. Um, do you have those? Yeah. So we know in 1982, it was July 3rd of 1982. January, I'm sorry, so you already got me. January 3rd, 1982. Do you have the 75? Um, so we believe it's around January of 1975 as well. That one's been very difficult because of the records. It's difficult to get records from that far back. Um, so we are still in the process of verifying all that information. Um, but the 1982 case, he was released in 1993. Uh, in 94, he was arrested again for a parole violation for some kind of curfew violation. Um, and then after that, he was in a workforce type parole setting where he actually had to stay at the jail until about 2011. Um, from there, he was released and he was on parole, and he was released um, in 2016, October of 2016. That was the Texas jail? Yes. All of this? Everything All was of in this. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone who's together a microphone, please do it now so that everyone knows who's in front of the court. Please, please.